All right, a um, couple of things. Um, one is I am going to, I'm, I'm zooming the, this lecture. Um, and so if the, for some reason that you can't be here or whatever, um, again, it'll always be recorded. But in case there's a goof up and something goes wrong with the recording, um, I've got sort of this backup here. Uh, and so anyway, again, if you want to get into the, to, to the Zoom, all you need to do is um, use my personal meeting ID. Have I sent that out to you guys or just say 11 o'clock? Okay. So, so you can just look in personal meeting ID, which is just my phone number, and then the password just Wolfram with a little W. And you should be able to, if you're not here for some reason, you should be able to just um, link in uh, or you know just come in and uh, watch the zoom the, it also will have a it'll store the zoom recording but it, it's not near the quality as the video so but anyway it'll it'll be there as a backup I'll have that zoom recording as a backup just in case um, something were to happen um, the other thing is, and I sent out an email that I'm not going to be in the office tomorrow, so I have to go to Ann Arbor, so I won't be in the office tomorrow. But uh, Rich should have regular office hours the rest of the rest of the week. All right. Um, so last time we were looking at uh, contract law, and noticed that you know contracts are places where you can bargain. You know, tort law was where you didn't have time to bargain. You have some sort of uh, so, you know, it was about, basically about accidents. But tort law, uh, uh, contract law is that, okay, if you have a, um, if, if you can have a bargain, what both sides can be better off, right? And so we'd like to have bargaining if we could, right? So we want to have, the, have, have a, a, a contract law which improves the chances that you're going to go ahead and, uh, and take on a bargain. Um, and then we, you know, take, took a look at um, what, what you should do to uh, uh, enforce, the, enforce the contract. And we looked a little bit about precaution, just like tort law. You want people to take efficient precaution against the, they're going to breach either the, both the promisor and the promisee. Um, and so uh, we wanted to, we talked about um, over-reliance. That is, if you, uh, if what happens is you have, you, you know that you're going to be fully compensated for uh, what uh, your expectation is, then you, the the uh, uh, promisee, might you know have a bigger venue than you otherwise would, or you you know you don't take on um, uh, take on things which would uh, re uh, reduce your losses if the thing didn't happen, right? Uh, and uh, similarly, when we were talking about tort law, uh, if we make it so that you uh, have no liability. Um, then the person, the, you know, the potential uh, victim will undertake precaution. And if you have uh, strict liability, then the person who might cause the damage uh, undertakes proper precaution. And then we had a negligence rule to say, okay, you know, part of the problem is that how do you get both sides to take on proper precaution? Um, and uh, the, I mean, it's, it's difficult to do in a uh, in, in contract law, but you get the same idea, right? You can, you know, uh, how you want to set set the law up will um, will depend on what you think is most likely to happen, right? And that's been basically the the course itself, right? It says, okay, here's here's what we like to do to have the most efficient way of doing it, but um, this will be sort of a problem. Uh, let's use our insights to think about how we're going to deal with it when we have a problem. Um, the next thing that uh, we want to talk about is uh, uh, what about um, the, the, the interpretation of the contract. Uh, and um, so we'll put interpretation, interpretation of the contract. That is, how do we, what happens when we're, we're looking at a contract and something goes wrong, how, how should we take a look at what that contract says? Because what's, what's happening is that contracts are when something's happening over time, right? When we need a contract, we said we don't need a contract when we go down and, uh, uh, you know, 
buy a, uh, a hamburger at, uh, you know, whatever the name, I forget the name of the hamburger place that's just north of campus. That's, anybody remember what the, what is it? Yeah, Burgers Unlocked. So when I go to buy a hamburger from Burgers Unlocked, I don't have to worry about a contract, right? Because even, even my wife and I went there and there was like a 20 minute wait or something, right? So, okay, maybe we paid them and then they didn't give us the hamburger and then, you know, but that's highly unlikely, right? So, but what, what, what happens when, why do you need a contract when you got something is promised here uh, and then there's a payment, right? We talked about one of the things that you have to do uh, about to, to enforce the, or to have an enforceable contract, and we talked about problems with that. But anyway, uh, the point, one of the things to deal with that here is what happens if there's contract imperfections? That's really what we're concerned about here, imperfections. Um, because, you know, what, what this thing's happen over time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise you something, um, you're going to give me the money to do it, and, uh, or, or at least um, that, that, that's the, the primary way that's going to happen, uh, you're going to give me the money to do it, and then something happens, it's going to be like a year or six months or something between um, when I give you the money and you're going to build the house, right? And so there's lots of stuff that could happen in the interim. So uh, if you sort of think about it, um, maybe you don't specify what kind of doors you were going to have in the, in the house. Because it's costly, if you sort of think about it, it's it would be costly to specify everything. Right? How could I, how could I, you know, write this contract that could say, well, gee, what happens if there's a storm, or what happens uh, if they, uh, um, uh, there's some, the zoning official says I can't have, you know, we've made this agreement on on uh, some building downtown, and then the zoning official say, well, you can't really have apartments on the first floor, right? So there's all sorts of things that could happen that you might not have thought about when you're writing a contract. So you're really not going to specify everything that's in there. So um, lots of things are going to be left out. So what happens? What should the courts do about if you have imperfect, what you know, imperfect? What will the courts do? if you have imperfect contracts, right? I mean, generally, um, especially if you have some sort of thing that's going to happen over a lengthy period of time, uh, uh, you know, a very lengthy period of time, or something that's really a, a large uh, a project, there's going to be lots of stuff that doesn't show up in the contract, right? Because you can't think of everything. And even if you could think of everything, you'd be spending all this time, you know, uh, bargaining with each other, and the attorneys would be writing all this stuff out, so you really can't do it. So if you sort of think about um, basically three things that they could do, what could the courts do? One thing is they could enforce the contract in the explicit terms, even if there was a mistake, right? They could enforce the contract as written, even if there was a mistake, right? Um, it turns out that uh, you guys uh, uh, wrote into the contract something that was an error that nobody picked it up, right? You have this, say you have this, uh, uh, you know, 150 page contract and somebody put the wrong, uh, the wrong ordinance number in there, right? Or um, somebody put the, uh, uh, you know, let's say it had something to do with um, the spectrum and you're, you know, getting access to the spectrum in order to put satellites up there and you, and you put the wrong thing down there, right? So the, that's one thing the court could just say, hey, that's the way it was written, that's the way we're going to do it. A second thing that they could do, obviously, is they could uh, fill in the gaps. That is, the court could just say, okay, nobody talked about this. Um, this is what we're going to, um, this is, you know, what we're going to interpret it as, and we're going to put down, this is what should have happened. You guys didn't actually write it down, but here's the situation changed 
from when we first wrote the contract. And so we're going to try to figure, the court's going to try to figure out, okay, how should this contract have been enforced? The third thing they could do is they could replace explicit terms of the contract. That is, the court could say, hey, this whole thing changed. Uh, we're going to throw out what you guys said in the contract, and we're going to, uh, we're going to put in our own terms of what should happen in the contract. Okay? So basically, you're dealing with, um, you're dealing with, uh, there was a change or, and there was something that people hadn't either thought about or hadn't put in the contract because it was too expensive to go through and do everything. So what, you know, these are obviously the three major things that the courts could do, right? They could just say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna enforce the contract the way it was written. Um, you could, or we could say, hey, you guys didn't think about this and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna fill that gap in. Um, or we could say, hey, if you guys had known about this, then you would have written it differently, and we're going to put in what you know what we what we think is the uh, the way it should have been. Again, how would you do it if you were thinking about the efficient way of doing it, right? From an economic standpoint, what would be the efficient way to do it? And what you would do is you you would uh, impose terms that the parties would have agreed to. Efficiency says, what would you do? You'd impose the terms that the parties would have agreed to if they had known what had happened. Right, um, and so uh, um, again, that would it's if if only I had known, right? I mean that's sort of the story, right? If I, if only I had known, this is what you know what what was going to happen. This is what we would have done, right? So how can you know that, right? How, again, how can you know what perfect compensation is for tort liability, right? You, 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 don't, you don't know what perfect compensation is, but what would you like to do? You'd like to have perfect compensation. How do I know what the e efficient X star is, right? How do I know what the efficient amount of precaution is? That might be hard to know, right? But you got some guidance. So in general, all we're saying here is that if we're looking at a, if we have, if we have an imperfect contract, people didn't think about something, things changed along the way, it turns out that the zoning ordinance made it so this thing can't really happen. So what, what should you do? You try to make it so that if you were the courts, what would you try to do? You try to make it so that this is what we think that the parties would have agreed to if they had known what the circumstances were gonna be, right? How can you know that? Probably can't, but again, guidance, right? Like, you know, use the example over and over again about on, just on the property law, right? People on, you know, we sort of know people on US 12 prefer the property right more than, or value the property right more than the people on Millens Road. There's transactions costs gonna be too high that, uh, that they'll be able to bargain. So we should put the property right to the one that values it the most. And we sort of know that there, right? So it might be something that's sort of obvious that said, oh, wow, you know, they, we, let's, let's think through this. And this is what they would have, what the parties would have done uh, if, they had known this circumstance was going to happen. All right. Um, a second thing to think about is when would the court just say, ha, we're going to throw out these terms. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to throw out the terms of the, the contract, right? So a second thing to think about is um, when would the courts throw out the terms of the contract. And we'll make a list of these. Uh, we'll make a list of these things. But the first one is, if you sort of think about it, one party is not competent, right? Of 
courts would say, wait a minute, no, competent. Did I spell competent? Yeah. Um, one party's not competent. So think about it. Can you enter in a contract with somebody that's 16? Anybody know? No, right? You can't, you know, a minor can't go out and sign a contract, right? Or he might say, this person was, um, had uh, a mental disability, right? And so we're going to say they're not, they weren't competent to, to, uh, uh, to sign this contract, right? So the court could just say, hey, we're throwing this contract out. Another issue is, is this contract signed under duress, right? That is, you held a gun to my head and forced me to sign the contract, okay? Um, if there was something where... I was, you, you can think of, and, and why are we, why would that happen? Because what are we trying to do? We're going to, we want to, imp, you know, we want to improve the probability that people are going to come to a bargain, right? Both parties better off. If what happened was one party forced the other party to do something, or there was some duress that was going on, they wouldn't have bargained, right? Uh, and so you could say, hey, that, you know, that contract was signed under duress. Um, you know, there was something that, you know, they would have died if they hadn't signed the contract. Uh, we're going to say, no, that contract isn't, isn't uh, viable. Um, related to that would be some sort of dire necessity. All right? Duress is where one party is forcing the other party to sign. All right. The court might throw some out, throw out uh, at least some conditions of the of the contract if there was clearly a dire necessity and the terms were obviously in excess of a normal bargain. The terms were in excess of a normal bargain. Right? There's some condition that you, um, you had to have this, uh, uh, well, you know, let's say um, there was a fire and uh, you were trying to get out of the, of the fire and a person, uh, you know, uh, uh, is a, uh, 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 an Uber driver, and they say, okay, uh, $30,000 to get you, uh, you know, uh, we're going to enter this contract that I'll, I'll drive you, for, you know, out of here for $30,000, right? The court might say, wait a minute, this, this is way beyond what the two parties would have agreed to, right? Because that's, again, what are we trying to do? Was that a true bargain? No. If there was a dire necessity in the terms the court would look at it and say, oh, wow, no, this is, this is beyond what a normal bargain would be, right? Now, does the, the, the court really know what the normal bargain would be? Again, if it's close, probably not. But there might be situations where it's, it's clear this, you know, this was a, um, an agreement that is way uh, beyond what we would have uh, expected the parties to bargain to. So the, the court might... Uh, might the court might just say, no, um, you only have to pay, you know, $500 or whatever. Uh, that, you, know, we're, you know, you didn't pay the $30,000 or whatever. But we're, we're going to say, uh, no, that was a, that was a necessity, uh, and we're going we're gonna to make you pay $500 instead of the $30,000. Um, impossibility, right? So something happens that makes it impossible. Something happens that makes it impossible for the contract to be fulfilled. For example, suppose that you uh, had a, uh, a, a, a contract where you were going to have your hip replaced, um, and then the surgeon tears his bicep. Not that anybody that we know that could have happened to him. Um, but uh, if that were to happen, right, then the courts would say, no, nah, hey, you know, it's impossible to fulfill that contract, and so uh, that we're going we're gonna to throw that contract out, 
right? So if there is some event that makes it impossible to fulfill, um, there's a, a war all of a sudden goes on, or there's a, uh, you know, a, there's probably lots of things that happened out in California and the fires in California or Colorado or the, uh, all the, uh, you know, hurricane damage and things that are happened, happened in uh, New Orleans or, uh, or that uh, uh, Louisiana area. There's probably lots of things that happened that now make it impossible for these contracts to be fulfilled. Then so the court might just say, hey, you know, Forget it. That, you know that that's impossible to fulfill the thing. So we're not going to we're not going to um, uh, we're not going to enforce that contract. We're just going to throw it out. We're going to set aside the terms of it. Um, a fifth thing would be if they were in violation of public policy. Yes, comrade. The, yes, I mean, he, uh, Conrad was saying, what happens if the, um, if the doctor was doing something that uh, he was not taking proper precaution, right? So, th so you could say, yeah, no, it was a breach of contract there. Um, so, it, you know, the, the courts may determine that, yeah, we're, we're not, it was not impossible because something outside of what they were bargaining about could happen. Right? Again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make it so that an efficient bargain happens. Well, maybe the, uh, maybe the um, or let's say it would be different than if the, uh, um, the, the surgeon uh, had a, uh, you know, a car accident or lightning struck and, and hit him, right? So you're right. Uh, uh, and you might, you know, again, this is when you might throw some out, but you might say, well, wait a minute, um, maybe you should have an alternative surgeon available, right? Which in fact, this particular instance that I'm referring to, um, yeah, they're, you know, they have alternative surgeons that they could say, okay, somebody else can do it. Uh, but if you want this particular surgeon, uh, you know, you can't do it. So you might have a choice that says, okay, you have this alternative surgeon that can do it, and you might say, no, I, I, don't, I don't want that. I'd prefer to just wait until the surgeon can perform it, right? So it's again a matter of, uh, you know, the big picture is I want to make it so that this, this sufficient bargain happens, um, but I also want to make it, it's what we were talking about e earlier, do you want to take precaution against breach of the contract, right? Um, do we, you know, so we want, we want people to take, we don't want them to go, gee, yeah, I can do any old darn thing because if a, a disaster happens, it'll be impossible and then the courts will throw it out, right? It's a matter of if this impossible to fulfill the contract, like I said, because, you know, the town burned down, uh, then the court will probably say, nah, you know, parties, if they'd have known the place was going to burn down, you know, they wouldn't have agreed to this contract to start with. Um, so, again, if you had, um, uh, uh, let's say you had uh, two uh, uh, companies that got together and said, we're not going to compete, right? You could, you could write a contract that says, we're not, we, we agree not to compete with one another. If you don't, uh, you know, if you don't, you know, we won't sell in the Midwest uh, and you agree not to sell in, uh, you know, the East Coast or whatever, that would be in violation of antitrust law, right? So such a contract would, would not be viable and the courts would throw out a contract that was in violation of some statute uh, that was there because of, uh, because of other public policies. Um, Another thing that the court might throw it out is because of uh, asymmetric information. Remember that we've talked about asymmetric information before. That is, here's something that should have been revealed that wasn't revealed, okay? So the court may decide, oh, wait a minute, you know, um, you didn't reveal that this car, uh, the brakes didn't work, 
Okay? And if you ever, you know, you go out to buy a car, you go out to sell a car, there's some things that you have to reveal. Or you go to buy and sell a house, there's some things that you have to reveal. Um, and so the courts may say, uh, uh, you know, you might set up the statute of, okay, you have to reveal things which uh, are safety issues, right? You don't have to reveal uh, that you only change the oil every 10,000 miles instead of every 5,000 miles, but you might have to reveal that the brakes don't work, okay? Um, or it could be that there's fraud involved. That is, you know about this thing um, and uh, you, you're giving them information that it, that the other party doesn't know about and it's not correct information. So they may just say, no, this is, this is a fraudulent contract. There was fraud involved. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna enforce this contract. Uh, another thing would be frustration of purpose. That is, you guys set up this contract uh, and um, the purpose for which you had this bargain isn't there any longer. You, you, it, there's no purpose to the contract any longer. Something happened. Let's say um, you, uh, you um, sign a contract with a, uh, a again, a, a rock band uh, to play at a venue, and then there happens to have this virus that shows up uh, and uh, the government says you can't have, uh, you know, uh, venues can't be open. So the purpose for which you signed the contract was to have a rock and roll concert, but rock and roll concerts can't happen, right? So had you, again, had you known that the coronavirus was going to show up uh, and that you wouldn't be able to have rock concerts for the next eight months, then you would say, uh, that contract is no longer viable, right? We're not going to enforce that contract. So again, uh, sort of interesting, uh, you know, I haven't read anything about it, but it might be interesting to look into what's been going on uh, with um, contracts with uh, um, orchestras or contracts with uh, uh, actors or, you know, that sort of thing. What if you're a, what if you're a Broadway actor and, they, and, you know, Broadway gets shut down? Um, what, you know, I, I haven't read about what's been going on there, but certainly that's something that we, you, we're talking about here, right? We're saying, hey, um, you know, I've got this contract with you, uh, or how about NBA basketball or, you know, football games? Uh, you know, we just, w just watched the World Series, right? And there's very limited number of people in the stands in the World Series, which means that the revenue coming in from the World Series is way less than had been anticipated. Um, how, you know, how, how, are, how are things going to uh, work, uh, work that way, right? Uh, again, um, again, just coming up with, hey, here's, here's problems that could develop. Uh, and then how do you want to, uh, how do you want to deal with these problems? Uh, if you, you know, again, I don't know specifically, but this is sort of an interesting time where there's probably lots of frustration of purpose going on. Uh, it might be interesting to, to look at what's, what's actually happening, right? I mean, if you're, suppose that you had to have an eight to 10 page paper due at the end of the semester, um, and uh, uh, which, you do, um, uh, you know, that might be a, uh, uh, you know, a topic to look into because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's up, up, up to date. And the last thing um, is uh, if it was unconscionable. How do I spell unconscionable? I wanna make sure I get it right. Um, if it was unconscionable, um, there's a C in there too, so I thought. Same thing happened with property law, right? Can you sell your children, right? What can you do? Remember we were talking about in property law, what can you do with your property? There were some things we said, no, you can't do that with your property, right? This, some, some properties you can't sell or some properties you can't do things with. Same thing here. Um, can, can you have a contract that is just unconscionable, right? 
uh, you agree to um, uh, you agree to to uh, sell both your kidneys, right? And um, so you're going to die, but the money's going to go to your kids, right? Or their money's going to go to your wife or your husband. You know, could you enter into such a contract? Probably not, right? And so uh, there, you know, again, these are issues where um, there are certain things that, that, that we're just not going to allow you to do in terms of contracts, just like there are certain things that we're not going to allow you to do with their property. Okay. All right. So again, these are sort of um, enforcement issues. Uh, again, what you're trying to do is to think through what would the part, you know, there's something that, that goofed up or something that uh, we're not going to allow to happen, and what we want to do is figure out, okay, what, what would the parties have agreed, and if you're going to be efficient, what would the parties have agreed to if they had known that, you know, the, the virus would have happened, or if they had known that uh, there was going to be a change in the zoning laws, or if they had known that, uh, you know, there's going to be big fires in California, and all of a sudden uh, uh, prices of lumber, which is what's been going on, right? Prices of lumber are going through the roof. Because you talk to anybody that's a contractor, uh, that's one of the issues that they're dealing with. Is uh, the, you know the suppose that you know you uh, uh, agree to um, sell me a condo that you're building, uh, and then all of a sudden the price of uh, lumber. Uh, goes up so high that it would be better for you to, to just breach the contract, right? So again, uh, do you, you know, how do you, again, go, sort of goes back to how, how do you want to enforce a, a breach of contract? Which, um, let's look at contracts that occur outside of the courts because there might be lots of things where you don't actually write a contract out. We talked about that. You might just do something with, with a handshake, right? Um, and so what would happen if it was expensive to go to court about this, this thing? Maybe, maybe um, the, the, the loss to you uh, is you know, $500. Uh, an attorney is going to run you $250 or $300 an hour. It might not make any sense to go ahead and have the courts decide, right? There might be lots of things that are that way. So how do you enforce things outside of the courts? Um, and, you know, if you're going to enforce contracts outside of the courts, and one way to do that is relationships. That is, you have a party that you do things with uh, over and over again, okay? Um, you have a plumber that you use at your house, okay? I'll tell you, we, we've had uh, Paul Jabor do our plumbing since we got here in 1989, okay? And now his son runs the, the, the plumbing as it is. Right? We've never signed a, th a, you know, a contract with Paul Jabor that said, oh, uh, you know, I want you to, you know, I don't know, fix the toilet over, you know, in the, in the back bathroom. Uh, and they say, oh, it's going to cost, you know, $450 to fix the, you know, fix the toilet. You just say, okay, fine, do it, right? We're not going to go to the bother of figuring out a contract hiring an attorney to make sure that the contract's written correctly. Um, and, and, if, and if Paul didn't fix the toilet correctly, uh, that we're, we're going to sue him, right? That's probably not going to happen. So if you look at relationship, uh, you know, relationships, um, how can you punish the other party? Right? Can you somehow enforce the bargain without having to go through the courts? And if, the, if you have a, a, a relationship, um, then, then you may be able to enforce the agreement by simply not 
buying from them any longer, right? Going to a different plumber, right? If, if they don't, you know, if they, uh, uh, or you have a mechanic, right, and they don't seem to do a very good job, right? They're not doing the things that you wanted them to do. What happens? You switch to a different mechanic, okay? Um, and so if you, how can you think through this? One way to think through this is going back to game theory. And if we think back to game theory, we'd say, okay, if there's only one play of the game, then you probably can't enforce it, right? Right? Um, without, go, you know, if we're talking about you're going to go outside of the courts, okay? So, when, when there's more than one play, that is, if what, remember that what, what we're trying to do, it's, it's like the prisoner's dilemma, right? Your incentive is to cheat, right? And if there's one play of the game, then I know your incentive is to cheat. And so I'm not going to think this contract is very enforceable, so I'm not likely to go into that contract. But if the game's played over and over again, right? If it's a repeated game, then it's likely to be enforceable. Right? Because what can happen is you can just not buy, buy from this person along. longer. Basically, you're, you end the relationship. Right? So if you have a situation where, you know, you're a plumber and you want to have these people, uh, you know, uh, call you to do the plumbing, okay, what do you know? You know that if you do a lousy job, then they're going to call a different plumber the next time. Uh, and I know when I go to hire them, I know they know that I can enforce the contract by not hiring them again, and so now what we know is we could, uh, you know, I, we, we have this relationship in a, in a, as the mechanism by which we're going to enforce the contract. So I don't have, you know, I don't sign contracts with glory to God when I take my car in to have it fixed. Um, uh, you, know, you know, if it were something that was really expensive, right, you know, a $15,000 uh, job, you know, you'd think about maybe you want to sign a contract. But then again, you have administrative costs of, if I'm going to sue them, I got to do what? I got to look at the expected gain, right? I got to go, okay, what is the probability that I'm going to win? Um, what is the probability I'm going to get the amount that I am asking for? Um, what is the cost of, of going to court, et cetera? Right? So uh, most of the things that we do, we could fit within this idea of a bargain, a promisor and a promisee, right? Uh, but lots of these things are going to be enforced outside of, uh, outside of using the courts. Now, what happens if you know the number of plays in the game, though, right? What if it's a repeated game, but what if there's a known number of plays. Let's say you know that the game's going to be played four times. And both of you know that, right? So example, uh, it's going to be played four times. Whoever gets to make the last play, right, if it's the fourth play, what do you think they're going to do, right? They have an incentive to cheat on the fourth play, right? Whoever's, whoever makes the fourth play or the final, you know, the final, in this case, fourth play has an incentive to cheat. But you have an incentive, right? You now have an incentive 
to cheat on the third play. Right? And so, but they know you have an incentive to cheat on the third play, so what they have an incentive to cheat on the second play, and then you have an incentive to cheat on the first play. So, again, if you, uh, you know, uh, either take game theory with Econ 415, or you take game theory, and uh, uh, I know Professor Clark in Intermediate Micro has a section on game theory. That's just one of the things that you look at in terms of a, uh, a, a prison limit sort of issue, that if there's a no, and what do you want to do? You try to get to the cooperative solution, right? Now, in, you know, if it's a big issue, if it's a big thing, then probably that's when this might become viable. But just to be, you know, sort of more precise, um, you know, if you have a repeated game, you could say, uh, you know, in a one-play game, it's clear that the other person has an incentive to cheat. It also turns out that if both parties know the number of plays, it's, you could have a situation where they know you're gonna cheat on the last play, so you're gonna cheat on the next to last play, but they know you're gonna cheat on the next to last play, and so it'll be difficult to get a cooperative solution. Again, in terms of most relationship, you know, sort of things, I, I don't know how many times Paul DeBoer is gonna have to come over and fix my plumbing, right? Um, so, and Paul doesn't know how many, or, you know, so, you know, in most of these things, it's, this just doesn't become an issue. If it were a major issue uh, where there was lots of money involved uh, and there was a fixed number of plays, then uh, you might want to, the, the, then the courts would probably be the, the mechanism that would, you know, you'd, you'd have a written contract uh, and you'd expect it to go to the courts. If it were something that had a, uh, you know, a, a limited number of plays or you guys know how many uh, uh, plays of the game there's going to be and there's a lot of money involved, then it might be worth it to you to uh, undertake the administrative costs of making this uh, put together. So, um, what do you try to do, right? You try to, well, just to, as, a, and as an example, uh, um, occasionally I do some consulting work, and there's one firm that I did some consulting work with, um, and they, uh, first time in decades, I got somebody that they haven't paid me, right? So I had sent them a bill, um, and they didn't, they, you know, it was like two months overdue. Um, and then they get a hold of me and say, oh, we'd like you to do this thing over here, right? Um, and it turns out that it's something that needs to be done, like, right away. And I just sent them back an email and said, well, gee, I'd really like to do that, but you haven't paid me. You're two months overdue on your bill. Guess what? Within two days, I had money sent to me, you know, into my into my bank account. Right? They made a direct deposit into my bank account. Um, uh, and so then, of course, what did I do? Then I did their little thing that they wanted me to do. Right? So th there's you know mechanisms to to enforce contracts outside of the courts. I wasn't going to. I mean. You know, it was only a $350,000 contract, so I, I didn't think it was worth going to the court. No. <laughs> so obviously it was, a, it was not large amounts of money here. Um, but nonetheless, it worked so that, you know, I was able to enforce it because, because they were having this relationship. In, you know, but like I said before, um, we have a, uh, uh, you know, we've been working with one of the uh, contractors, uh, a guy named Scott Calkins, been working with him since 1989, right? Um, and so when we ask Scott to do something and he says, oh, okay, um, it's gonna cost, you know, $600 or whatever, um, you know, we don't sign a contract because we've worked with Scott, you know, over, you know, for decades. Um, and, uh, you know, he's worked with us. He knows we're gonna pay him. Right? And so if you develop long-term relationships, right, that's what does that do? That in increases the chance of bargaining, right? Because you know that 
it's going to be fulfilled. And again, that's what contracts are about, right? Trying to get people to, um, to have enforcement of, uh, uh, of, of the contract. Why do you want to have enforcement of the contract? Because then people are more likely uh, to enter into the bargain. All right, so let me just, just give you a, a where we're headed next. We're, we're, we've, we've now finished chapter eight and we're gonna run through some of the topics in chapter nine. We're not gonna do everything that's in chapter nine because some of it's a little more detailed than we really need to get into. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll go through some of the, the topics in chapter nine and that's uh, you know topics in, in uh, contract law. Um, and it, and it basically, again, one of the first things we're gonna talk about is what, it, what is the remedy if somebody violates the contract, right? This is where we're headed. We're gonna look at remedies for violation of a contract. And again, the big picture is um, I wanna have a credible, an incredible, uh, a, a credible um, uh, uh, commitment in order to have the contract come together, right? You're, I'm more likely to enter into this bargain with you if there's a credible commitment to enforcing the contract, right? So the, it's, uh, you, you have more likely to bargain if there's a credible commitment uh, to the bargain, right, to the contract. And so again, that's the big picture of the thing. Um, I want, you know, there's, there's a, uh, a surplus that you know, we talked about you know, several times. There's a surplus that happens when we cooperate with one another. Uh, and so we'd like to maximize that surplus. So we'd like to have bargains going on. And so if I have an enforceable contract, then I'm more likely to bargain with you than if that contract isn't going to be, if I know that contract's not enforceable, then I'm not likely to do that bargain. So then the, the question that we're going to deal with to start with is um, what should the remedy be if you go ahead and violate the contract? So I know what the, what the remedy is going to be. Uh, and if, uh, you know, we'll look at basically three different types of remedies uh, and, and just give, again, just giving observations about them. Not that there's any particular one that is always right, uh, but it gives you some guidance on where you want to be if you're writing the statutes or uh, if you're involved in, uh, uh, you know, if you work with a firm uh, that, uh, you know, is a law firm or whatever, just to give you an idea where, where it ought to be had it. All right, so for um, Wednesday, uh, we will, again, I'm not going to have office hours tomorrow, but for Wednesday, what we'll do is um, uh, we'll, we'll be working through uh, the topics in the contract law, and in particular, uh, we're going to start out looking at uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of damages you would have. You could have expectation damages, you could have reliance damages, you could have a damage that pays for your opportunity costs, et cetera, so we'll go through that uh, for, uh, for Wednesday. But in the end, we're going to go through the topics, but, and again, if you just want to, it's, it's not like it's a bad idea to have read the parts that we're not going to talk about in class, um, but there will be some things that we will emphasize more than, more than others. All right? Okay. And um, I don't think there's anybody here that had that all, you know, I forget who hasn't picked up their exam yet, but all you guys have picked up your exam, so.